All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and our RBT practice exam question series where we're going through the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out btexamreview.com for all our study materials, including our famous combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. Other than that, let's work hard, study hard, get to our questions. Craig needs to spend more time at his desk doing his homework after school. His mom moves his desk into the living room so she can observe him. After a certain amount of time at the desk, Craig's mom will give him a dollar. Sometimes this is 10 minutes, and sometimes this might be 12 minutes. This represents what type of schedule? Four basic reinforcement schedules that you need to know. Fixed ratio, fixed interval, variable ratio, variable interval. Very similar to our punishment and reinforcement questions. We're simply going to break these down and then combine them. So we know fixed means it's unchanging, and variable means it's changing or an average. Ratio means a response. Interval means time. So we just need to identify the two aspects and then put those together. So we know that his mom moved his desk into the living room so she can observe him. And then after a certain amount of time at the desk, Craig's mom gives him a dollar. So if getting the dollar is based on time, is that a ratio or an interval? Well, it's an interval, right? Ratios based on responses, intervals based on time. So now we ask ourselves, is that a fixed amount of time or a variable? Well, sometimes it's 10 minutes, sometimes it's 12 minutes. So it's always changing, it's an average, we're not quite sure, Craig's not quite sure. So it's going to be a variable amount of time. So if Craig gets reinforced on a variable amount of time, well, the schedule is going to represent a variable interval. And if you break down the questions like that, you can't miss the basic reinforcement schedule questions. And if you're just starting to study, that might seem tedious. But as you do it more, you're going to get better and you're going to get quicker. Accuracy is how you get fast, okay? You can't force yourself to go fast. You want to be accurate and the speed will come. Which scenario best represents non-contingent reinforcement? All right, first things first. What is non-contingent reinforcement? Reinforcement that isn't dependent on a behavior. It's just reinforcement given regardless of what's occurring. And it's typically going to be on a schedule, right? So 10 minutes, every 10 minutes, you give reinforcement. Every five minutes, something along those lines. But the key is, it doesn't matter what behavior is going on. Reinforcement is still being given. There's no contingency in place. So if we're looking for the scenario that represents non-contingent reinforcement, we're looking for a scenario where reinforcement is given no matter what. So A, Albie receives praise anytime he asks his tutor to help him with a math problem. All right, so Abby's getting praise, but isn't contingent on something. Well, it is. His tutor, right, is giving him praise if he asks for help. That is contingent, okay? We're looking for a non-contingent reinforcement. B, Sophie gives her daughter a slice of her favorite fruit every five minutes, regardless of what the daughter is doing. All right, the fruit is the reinforcement, and Sophie is giving it regardless of what the daughter is doing, that is non-contingent. B looks good. C, Anthony throws out the trash when he sees that it is full. Simply a response. We're not looking at really a non-contingent reinforcement scenario. And then Bob checks his mail at 2 p.m. every day. It doesn't appear that Bob is getting any sort of reinforcement here. We're not sure about what's happening other than Bob's checking his mail. There's no non-contingent scenario happening in C or D. You can eliminate those. Only in B is Sophie giving her daughter a slice of the favorite fruit every five minutes, regardless, not contingent, of what the daughter is doing. A is different because reinforcement is delivered contingent upon Albie asking for help. You have to understand the difference between non-contingent reinforcement, which is an antecedent strategy, and just regular reinforcement, which is a consequence strategy. Your supervisor, behavior analyst, shows up to work one day and starts telling you how horrible their week has been. They ask if you can write a few of their insurance reports as a favor and they will make it up to you. You've never written a report before. How should you respond? All right, an ethical scenario. You are uh, being supervised by a behavior analyst. They tell you their week has been horrible. So they want you to write a few of their reports as a favor and they promise they will make it up to you. So on the surface, okay, seems pretty innocent. The issue is what? Well, the issue is you've never written a report before. So is it ethical as a technician 
to engage in something you aren't competent in or that you aren't trained in? Absolutely not, especially when it involves a client. So just because your supervisor is asking you to do this, you're not competent. So how do you respond? A, you should make sure that what you get in return is of equal value to writing the report. Well, it's not really relevant here, okay? We're not worried so much about what they're going to give you in return. It's just you've never written the report before. Because you can be friends with your supervisors. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? They can ask you to do things, and as long as they're not abusing their powers, okay? Okay. The problem is you've never written it before. You aren't competent. B, you should deny the request since you lack the competence. Yes. If you aren't trained in writing reports, you should certainly not write the reports for them. So you have to deny that request, which can be challenging, but it's what you have to do. C, you should fulfill the request since your supervisor is the one who asked you to do it. Just because your supervisor asks you to do something doesn't necessarily mean you always need to do it. Okay? Now, you still have to follow through, deliver treatment, do the things you're asked, and provide the best services to the client. But if something doesn't feel right or something is unethical, you're not obligated. In fact, you're responsible for not engaging in unethical activity. Doing something you're not competent in is unethical. And then D, you should report your supervisor to the BACB for an ethical violation. Well, not necessarily. At first, you can try to work it out. Okay, that's the first step. Can you work it out? Can you just say, well, I don't lack competence? If they continue to push, then you can escalate it. But your first response should just be, well, I'm not competent. I haven't written a report. I cannot help you here. Maybe later on, if, they, if you want, they train you and you learn to write reports. Maybe not. But at the present time, given the information, you, you lack the competence. So you have to deny the request to write these reports. Which of the following examples represents a continuous schedule of reinforcement? Now, what schedule is continuous? There's only one. Fixed ratio one, where every single response is reinforced. There are no other schedules that are continuous. Not an FR2, not an FI1, not a VI1, just an FR1. That is a fixed ratio one where every response is reinforced. So if we're going to find a continuous schedule, we need to find a schedule where every single response is reinforced. A, a technician tells their client to clap their hands. The client does. So the technician says, stop your feet. The client does and receives a token. Well, the client engaged in two responses to get a token. That is not continuous, not FR1. B, Bobby sits at his desk for one minute, answers the question correctly, and then receives praise. This Bobby sat at his desk for a single minute. That is an interval of one minute, not continuous, not FR1. C, James checks his email once an hour for a notification from his boss. Sometimes his boss emails him. Sometimes he does not. James checks his email. Sometimes he gets reinforced. Sometimes he, sometimes he doesn't. With a continuous schedule of reinforcement, reinforcement is always delivered. C, not continuous. So are A, B, or C continuous? They are not which is the following represent a continuous schedule of reinforcement. Well, D, none of the above. Kelsey is on the phone with her boss. In the background, she hears her daughter saying, Mommy, 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 over and over again. Kelsey is starting to become annoyed, so she says, What is it? to her daughter, and her daughter stops saying, Mommy. Kelsey now responds quicker in the future to her daughter saying, Mommy. This is an example of what? All right, we have a reinforcement punishment question. What do we ask ourselves? We ask ourselves, has the behavior increased or decreased? And has something been added or taken away resulting in the increase or decrease? We'll always break it down, right? Whose behavior? We're looking at Kelsey. Kelsey now responds quicker in the future to her daughter saying mommy. Okay, and why does she do that? Well, the antecedent, right, is daughter saying mommy, mommy, mommy over and over again. Kelsey says, what is it? As a result, her daughter stops saying, mommy. So was something removed? Yes. What was removed? Well, mommy, right? So we're looking at negative. As a result of the removal, Kelsey now responds quicker. Her behavior has increased. So we remove something to increase behavior in the future. We're looking at negative reinforcement. 
Again, break it down. Whose behavior? Kelsey. Our antecedent. Mommy, 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 over and over again. Response. What is it? Consequence. Mommy is removed. As a result, Kelsey responds quicker in the future. Removal, increase, negative reinforcement. Just like that, every single time when you're practicing. If you do it, if you're diligent, you will get better and you will pass your exam. Josh is running discrete trials with his client. He tells the client to point to the door and the client points to the table. He tells the client to point to the table and the client points to the door. Josh then says, point to the door and points to the door himself. The client points to the table. Josh attempted a what? All right, whose behavior? Josh's, okay? When we have multiple parties, make sure you identify the right person who you're looking at. We're looking at Josh's behavior. What did Josh attempt? Well, we know he's running discrete trials. He says, point to the door. Client does not point to the table. Client does not. So Josh says, all right, point to the door and then points to the door himself. So what has Josh done here? Hey, a punishment procedure. Did Josh attempt to punish the client at all? Has he reduced any sort of behavior? Well, no, the client still pointed to the table. There's no consequence of punishment. There's no punishment procedure going on. B, prompting procedure. Sure. What kind of prompt? Well, it looks like a gesture, right? Josh says point to the door and then points to the door himself. He's gesturing where he needs the client to point. It looks like a prompting procedure, right? B C, naturalistic procedure. Well, we know he's running discrete trials. So discrete trials are not naturalistic. It can't be naturalistic. And then D, none of the above. Well, we have a lot of information that indicates Josh used a prompting procedure. He gave the SD, point to the door. He gave the prompt, point to the door himself. The client points to the table, but it doesn't matter because Josh still attempted a what? A prompting procedure. We're looking at Josh's behavior, not the client's. After studying hard, you finally pass your technician exam. You are so excited and really want your best friend to pass their exam as well. You remember a few questions from the exam, so you share with them your friend. You share them with your friend while helping them study. What have you done wrong? All right, ethical question. You're trying to help your friend out, which is admirable, right? Because you studied hard, you passed your exam, and you want your friend to do it too. Okay, you want your best friend to pass the exam as well. You can go get jobs, on and on. However, you share questions from the exam. It's a big no-no. You cannot share any questions from the exam. So what have you done wrong? A, nothing. Congratulations on passing your exam. Well, congratulations, but you still violated the ethical code. B, you should not be helping someone else study if you already passed your exam. Not true. You're more than welcome to help someone study. You just can't pass on questions. So C, the questions on the exam are protected by the BACB, should not be shared. That's just an ethical fact, right? One of the most basic, simple ethical facts we have. The questions are protected. They're not to be shared. They're not to be given away. If you remember them, do not share them. And then D, you must wait six months to help someone study for their exam. Again, no, you're free to help them study. You just cannot share the property of the BACB, which is their exam questions. Which of the following is not considered a behavior using the dead man's test? Now, depending on what program you used, and hopefully your program taught you about the dead man's test, the dead man's test is what? Well, it, it, it's a way for us to identify a behavior for change, okay? If a dead man can do it, we don't want to teach it or use it, okay? Non-compliance. Well, a dead man can't comply. They're always not compliant. Um, not moving. Well, dead man doesn't move. That's not really something we can target. But let's say sitting down in a chair. Well, dead man can't sit down, okay? They can be sitting in a chair, but they can't sit down, right? So don't overthink this. You just need to be aware of the dead man's test. If, if a dead man can do it, we don't want to consider it a behavior for change. So you have to ask yourself, of the following, can a dead man do that? Joseph says go fish. Well, can a dead man say go fish? Obviously not. B, Samantha orders a martini. Can a dead man order a martini? Well, clearly not, right? Dead man can't say anything. C, a bird poops on your shoulder. Now, can a bird poop on a dead man's shoulder? Absolutely, okay? The, the person, you haven't done anything here. Something's happened to you. You haven't done anything. A bird pooping on your shoulder is not a behavior. Just something happened to you. 
And then indeed, Dave slips on some ice. Well, dead man can't slip because they aren't moving, right? So, which is the following is not considered a behavior. Well, a bird poops on your shoulder. Something happened to you, but you haven't done anything. You haven't engaged in any behavior. A client has gotten very good at making his own meals. He is now able to make himself a sandwich or heat up items in the microwave. He can do these things independently, but follow specific steps each time. Today, his technician moves the bread from its usual location to a different location. What is the technician attempting? Okay, we have a chaining question. We have different types of chains, right? Forward chaining, backwards chaining. Forward chaining, we teach the first step first. Backward chaining, last step first. Total task chaining, we teach all the steps. And then behavior chain interruption. What is that? Well, behavior chain interruption is when your client or your learner knows the chain, can complete the chain, but you interrupt it or you alter parts of the chain to evoke new behaviors. If this client can make himself a sandwich or heat up items in the microwave independently and follow specific steps, this is a perfect way to do a behavior chain interruption. Because what are you going to do now? Well, the technician is going to move the bread from its usual location to a different location. The technician is trying to get the client to engage in a different behavior because behavior chains and natural environments aren't always perfect. So this is forcing the client to engage in other behavior. So the technician is doing what? Well, he's interrupting the chain to try to evoke new behavior. He's using a behavior chain interruption strategy. All right, excellent. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials. Like, subscribe. Let us know when you pass so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.